In lieu of our Army Real Talk segment, we are pleased to share an interview with AUSA's President and CEO, General Retired Robert Brown, and United States Secretary of the Army, Christine Warmoth, to learn more about her vision for the future. Welcome to this special edition of AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Bob Brown, AUSA's President and CEO, and we are very fortunate to be joined today by the Honorable Christine Warmoth, the 25th Secretary of the Army. Prior to her confirmation in May 2021, she was director of the International Defense and Security Center at RAND Corporation, where she was a frequent writer and speaker on foreign policy, national security, and homeland security issues. Before that, she served in several roles during the Obama administration. From December 2010 until August 2012, she was a special assistant to the president and senior director for defense at the National Security Council. Secretary Warmoth then served as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Forces, and led the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review. From 2014 to 2016, she served in the Department of Defense as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, where she advised the Secretary of Defense on the full range of regional and functional national security issues. Secretary Warmoth began her public service career in 1996 serving nearly seven years as a civilian servant in the policy office of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Today is the first day of the Association of the United States Army's 67th Annual Meeting and Exposition, the largest land power exposition and professional development forum in North America, held in person at the Walter E. Washington Events and Convention Center in Washington, D.C. Ma'am, thanks for joining us, and we're excited to have you. And This is your first AUSA Annual Meeting since you became Secretary of the Army. What are your expectations? Well, first of all, General Brown, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. And I would just very much like to commend AUSA for putting on the annual event, even though we are unfortunately still in the middle of a pandemic. I know you all went to great lengths to make it possible for everyone to be able to come together in person. And I think that's terrific. I know while last year's event was virtual, I think everybody is looking forward to getting back together in person. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity for the Army, Congress, industry, and families to really be able to come together and talk about the challenges that are ahead of us, the successes that we've had in the last year, and there are many, and really the important discussion, I think, about where the Army is going in the future. So I'm looking forward to the energy of being here in person and having the opportunity to talk about the future of the Army at a moment in time where there's really, I think, a lot of urgency around the imperative for transformation. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. And it's been great teamwork to make sure that we're safe as we can possibly be. And there's nothing like being back in person. You know, the virtual was great, but boy, there's nothing like being in person for sure. So thanks for the great support. You know, the theme this year for the Army is America's Army and its people, transforming for the future. You were joining at a time of change for the Army. How do you plan to approach it? You know, I'm struck by the fact that the Army and the Department of Defense are often talking about transformation and talking about change. When I think back, you know, across the various positions that I've held in the Pentagon, we've talked about transformation a lot. I think what's different now in 2021, we see the fruits, if you will, of what China has been doing in the last 10 years, and we really don't have any more time left to be able to start shifting in very meaningful and practical ways to be able to deal with that and to be able to make sure that we are able to enhance our deterrence by manifesting a very combat credible force. And so I'm focused looking ahead at how we can put the Army on a sustainable, strategic path to try to address this challenge, in addition to, frankly, challenges we see with Russia and other adversaries. You know, we're facing some real strategic challenges in a time where there's downward pressure on the Defense Department budget and on the Army budget, and that's what I'm really going to be focusing on looking ahead. Well, that's just a tremendous point. I do agree completely. It is amazing how the future is here. All of a sudden, you know, transformation over the years, but now it's upon us. Thanks so much. Uh, Just a great point. You know, ma'am, I started the podcast detailing your wealth of experience on the demand side of national security during your time in OSD policy and at the National Security Council. 
Now at the helm of the Army, you're on the supply side, providing the Army's ready forces to join staff and combatant commanders. What have you learned from this role reversal? I think what's most striking to me, being on the other side of the mirror, as I like to put it, is the fact that our time horizon is quite a bit longer. Whereas when I was Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, you know, I tended to be thinking about what was coming in the next week or month or maybe at the most year. Here in the Army, you're really thinking five to ten years into the future. It takes us, in some cases, several years to bring on new weapon systems. It obviously takes time to develop our people, our most important resource. So the time frame is quite a bit different. I do think in a lot of my previous positions, I was focused on strategy and spent quite a bit of time working with the services in the POM process. So I probably had a little bit longer time frame than some folks who are dealing with a lot of the regional crises. But nevertheless, here on the Army side, we're really trying to think ahead five to ten years even as we obviously are paying a lot of attention to what's going on in our Army every day and trying to make sure that we're taking care of our people the way we need to. And also, we're obviously doing a lot of current operations, and certainly this year has been a very busy one in that regard. Certainly such a key time as we look at nearly 40 years since modernizing or greater. And boy, that's a great point of the time frame. Just fantastic. Thanks so much. And you've been in the position now as secretary for about four months. I know you've gotten out and I saw you were out in the Pacific, which is great, and Fort Hood and everything. Have you had a chance to meet with industry partners to date dealing with some of those modernization issues? I have. Certainly, I'd like to be able to do quite a bit more with industry, and I know that I will in the coming months, but I've had the opportunity in the last month to meet with a number of CEOs of some of our bigger companies. I've had the opportunity to engage with industry as I've been visiting some of our installations. So, for example, I was able to go and see the long-range hypersonic weapon prototype and engage with the industry team that's doing a lot of work for us there. When I was in Austin just a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to see the Army Applications Lab and talk about some of the work we're doing with smaller new technology startups. And I think we've done a lot of great things in terms of building relationships with non-traditional companies. But I look forward to being able to do a lot more with industry. And clearly, you know, I'll have lots of opportunity at AUSA to meet people and see all the great things that they're developing. Uh, That's impressive. You've been able to do all that in just your first four months, as busy as it always is. You know, you mentioned earlier the budgetary pressures and the Army's likely to continue to face some difficult choices in the near future. Downward budget pressure on readiness, modernization, and force structure accounts that are so key, as we heard, with the need to modernize and be prepared for great power competition. How will the Army maintain its momentum on critical people modernization readiness lines of efforts in this challenging time? Well, General Brown, I think we're going to try to do three things to keep the momentum going, even though we're in a time where, like I said, with inflation and the need to recapitalize the nuclear triad and just sort of the inevitably growing costs of people putting downward pressure on our timeline, there are really three things I think we're going to try to do to make sure that we continue to be on a sustainable path. The first thing is obviously working closely with Office of the Secretary of Defense as they develop the new national defense strategy. And that's important because the strategy, I think, will help tell us in the Army, in addition to our sister services, where we need to prioritize and where we need to take risk. And I think in a period of finite resources, and frankly, resources are always finite to some degree, we need to know where to prioritize and where to take risks. So that strategy development process is important. Two, we need to continue to look for efficiencies and innovations wherever we can. And the Army has been doing that, but we need to continue to do that to find all of the coins under the sofa cushions, as I like to say. So, you know, for example, we've done a lot of great things internally to really make sure that all of our installation commanders and major Army commands are being good fiscal stewards of the money that they have and making sure that we absolutely maximize our purchasing power. 
And then the third thing that's really important, I think, is doing some deep dives as we go forward, you know, across the whole Army enterprise, looking at force structure, looking at readiness, looking at our modernization programs, and really trying to do some analytical deep dives that will help inform the chief and I as we look ahead to building the next POM so that we can make good choices in that finite resource environment. That's impressive, and I can see why the Army is really leading the services in this challenging time. Those are uh, three key things. I did think uh, I might have to get my grandkids to help out a little bit. They're fantastic at finding the coins under the sofa cushion, so I'll make them available to help with that saving. We'll take every quarter we can get. (laughs) Absolutely. Now, just continuing a little bit on modernization, you know, when we look at it, it's really, as I mentioned earlier, the greatest modernization effort in over 40 years and so key. And you made some tremendous points of all the Army is doing in efficiencies and innovations. And I wonder if you can give us a little more on the progress has been made and what major systems will be fielded this year. Sure. As you may know, and some, you know, in the AUSA audience may know, we have already fielded this year the Enhanced Night Vision Goggles. We have already put out the new M Shorad. And we have developed a couple of the mobile protected fires prototype. And I was able to actually see those at one of my visits in the last couple of months. Coming up next year, we're going to be fielding the next generation squad weapon. We're going to be putting out the lower tier air and missile defense sensor, LTAMs. And then looking ahead to FY23, for example, and this is something I know that General McConville and I are both very much looking forward to, we are going to be fielding the first battery of the long-range hypersonic weapon. And we're making really good progress on that already. In March, we delivered the first prototype of the hypersonic equipment to soldiers. Two training canisters went out just this month. We are actually delivering all of the additional ground equipment for the prototype battery. So our soldiers will be able to start training on that equipment so that, again, when they get the final pieces in FY23, they will be ready to go. And the Army is really leading the way in the long-range hypersonics area. It's just great news. Having come from my last command in the Indo-Pacific, I can tell you that has been something that's needed a long time out there. It will be a significant game changer. Just fantastic. And it's so great to hear the other systems near and dear to so many of us helping that squad with the next generation squad weapons and enhanced night vision goggles. Really impressive. Thanks for that great effort. You know, the Army's number one priority is its people, and sometimes it's hard to contextualize how the Army is actualizing that mantra. So how is the Army addressing issues that keep soldiers and their families up at night? Tough question, but so important. There is a lot to unpack in the people initiative, I would say. Um, First and foremost, I'm very focused on making sure that our soldiers and families have quality of life. So in this area, I would say, for example, very focused on making sure that we're addressing our housing situation. Starting a couple years ago, we had some real challenges with the privatized housing on a lot of our installations. I think the Army has done a good job shining the spotlight on that and making sure that we're getting four-star level attention on holding the privatized housing companies accountable. We have changed their contracts in terms of how they are incentivized to make sure that they are increasing the speed of how they make repairs, how they do renovations, for example. I think we're really making progress there. We have a 10-year plan to modernize and update our barracks. I would like to go even faster on improving our barracks because I've seen some of our renovated barracks at places like Fort Hood and elsewhere, but I've also seen some of our barracks that are not in great condition, so there is more work to be done there. We are putting a lot of focus on child care centers. We're building two new ones in Hawaii and Alaska this year. We've also got programs in place to make sure that we're paying our child care center workers competitively because those people are so important. And I have to say, Bob, in the child care centers that I've visited since becoming Secretary of the Army, I've been a working mom. I have two daughters that are now grown up and in college, but I used daycare as a mom. And the quality of the people who are taking care of our kids at the child care centers has really impressed me. 
But I know that people still are sometimes having to wait for a long time to get into child care centers, and we're really trying to address that by also making sure that we have in-home care providers and that we are trying to make those in-home care providers more sustainable over time so that we have more capacity in addition to high-quality child care. Also, this is a relatively new thing that I think is really going to help out soldiers and families. This summer, we've really seen housing costs go up around the country, and so the Secretary of Defense recently authorized us to be able to increase BAH in 56 housing markets around the country, and that's going to mean that more than 67,000 Army soldiers are going to be able to get additional money in those higher-cost areas that they can put towards housing to try to offset the fact that we've just seen some really rapid increases in rent and mortgage payments. And another area we've been focused on is, you know, this has been a tough PCS season, so we are trying to get after that and smooth out some of the disruptions that we've seen there. So quality of life is a really important piece. We're also really focused on talent management, and this is something that the chief has just put incredible work into. I'm very, very impressed with what I see in terms of how we are selecting our battalion commanders, how we're selecting our colonels, and really doing much more of a 360-degree assessment and doing blind interviews and really looking at people in terms of their past performance on command climate. That has really, I think, revolutionized how we've been selecting our battalion commanders and colonels, and we're now expanding that approach to looking at how we're choosing sergeant majors. And we've got other interesting and exciting things like the software factory down in Austin where we're pulling soldiers with coding expertise from all over the Army regardless of what their MOS is, regardless of what their rank is, and giving them extra training and letting them develop new apps that help soldiers that they can download on their phones. So there's a lot of great work on talent management. And then I would just close on the people issues by saying, coming out of the tragic events of Fort Hood, we've done a lot of work, obviously, to respond to that and to learn from that experience. And we've just rolled out a new pilot at a number of installations in the Army called the Fusion Directorate that will put all of our resources for soldiers who have experienced sexual harassment or sexual assault into one physical location so that this will be a victim-centric approach that allows a soldier to come to one place and be able to tap into all of the resources that they need rather than having to go to multiple different places. And we're piloting that at six active duty installations, and we have one reserve pilot going as well. And I think that's something that's going to help us. We also have hired a new civilian director for our criminal investigative division, Mr. Greg Ford, He has a wealth of experience, and we are going to be changing CID so that 60% of our agents are civilians and 40% are military, and we've already started hiring civilians to come into CID. So I think, you know, those are, are direct and important responses to the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee. Thanks so much, Madam Secretary. You really covered all the issues that we hear out there from soldiers and families, and it's great to hear. I know we did a lot of feedback on how much that recent authorization to increase the BAH in 56 markets made such a huge difference. Many of the things you touched upon there are just so important. So thank you for that effort, and it certainly will help keep people first, no doubt about that. One thing I've found as I go and visit installations is that our soldiers and their families are not shy, (laughs) which is terrific. (laughs) Um, You know, sometimes when you're up here in the Pentagon bubble, you know, you can get a little bit disconnected. And so I find when I go and visit installations, it's very valuable for me to talk directly with soldiers and families. I've been doing sensing sessions all by myself to talk with very junior soldiers, to talk with mid-level enlisted. And that for me is an invaluable source of on the ground feedback about what is really happening and what is working or in some cases not working. That's a great point. It's one of our strengths, no question, is the tremendous independent spirit our soldiers and families have and allows us to empower them with mission command. And that's great that you're getting that feedback. I know it's fun to get out of the Pentagon too. You know, and, uh, Definitely and is. With those, yeah, with those great soldiers and families. And thanks for all the efforts there. It's really encouraging. 
I think one of the final questions is following America's withdrawal from Afghanistan, many are asking how the Army will be used in the renewed era of strategic competition that you mentioned several times. And what do you see as the role of the Army in the Indo-Pacific and the European theaters? Well, I think what we need to be focused on, and I alluded to this in one of my earlier answers, is we really need to be thinking about how can the U.S. Army enhance deterrence for the United States of America to try to prevent us from having to get involved in a conflict in either Europe or in the Pacific. And I think we do that in a few different ways. First of all, during the competition phase, if you will, there are lots of different terms swirling around for this, but basically what we mean by that is day to day now, we are actively competing with countries like China and Russia. And I think the Army is uniquely well positioned to help us in that competition because of the great relationships that we have with our allies and partners in both regions. Obviously, in Europe, we have the NATO alliance, which has served us incredibly well as a country for decades. And we are deeply involved with all of our NATO allies. And General Cavoli is a terrific leader with U.S. Army, European, and Africa Command. We've got our people in Europe doing any number of exercises in any given week and month to demonstrate just how effective we are in operating as part of a joint force, but operating as part of a combined coalition force. And in the same way, in the Indo-Pacific, we have army formations involved in exercises all over the Indo-PACOM theater, everything from smaller scale interactions with our Security Force Assistance Brigade up to much bigger exercises like what we saw this summer with Defender Pacific. And we really need to be focused on that because that kind of competition activity, I think, allows us to demonstrate some of these new formations like the multi-domain task force and what it can do. And our adversaries in the regions pay attention to those exercises and what we're doing. And I think it's important for us to continue that work. And as we develop all of these new capabilities, obviously, that will give us even more capability in terms of addressing anti-access and area denial capabilities. I would be interested, General Brown, given your last command as the general of USERPAC, about what you saw from that vantage point in terms of what the Army should be doing in the Pacific. Well, thanks, Madam Secretary. I'll tell you, you really hit the key points. There's tremendous relationships, and no one is out there like the Army is, and it's so key that that will enhance deterrence and prevent conflict. And you mentioned on the ground, so critical, always has been, and just brought a lot of pride when you talked about the multi-domain task force, because that is just a game changer of the ability to be there during competition, during that day-to-day -day phase, and to prepare so that if a crisis occurs, you're ready for and you can prevent that conflict and that escalation. Then I agree, Defender Pacific was a tremendous large-scale exercise, making a huge difference. Those allies and partners are a huge advantage that China, Russia, they just don't have. And so it's so key. And you also mentioned YesFab, which is just such a tremendous idea and really helps build those allies and partners across the region. So it is critical. And people will look, especially the Indo-Pacific, sometimes frustrating. They look and say, boy, there's a lot of water, but you know, people live on the land. And the land is absolutely critical. That's where the relationships are. And we have relationships like no one else and can be there and be present dealing with them and understanding these issues. So you're really so spot on and your look at the deterrence being so important. I do worry uh, the aggressiveness of China and Russia has been unbelievable, like never before seen. I uh, haven't dealt with China for over 30 years. And I worry about an accidental conflict. So the more we can show them don't be foolish, the better to prevent it, that's for sure. And I think the Chinese are very much paying attention to recent developments and the deepening relationships that we have, not just with long-standing allies like Australia, but Japan has been really evolving in terms of how they think about the role of their self-defense forces. 
I think you're seeing more and more focus around this idea of the quad with the United States, Australia, Japan, and India, or something like the AUKUS developments with the submarine and the relationship that we'll now have between Australia, the British, and the United States. And while that's a Navy thing, not an Army thing, I think those kinds of relationships and new initiatives are getting the attention of the Chinese and are helping us in terms of deterrence. Oh, absolutely. No doubt about it. You know, India will say they don't want alliances, but they realize they have to. They're getting surrounded by China on land, down both flanks and at sea. So that quad you mentioned is absolutely critical. And really, China got a little bit too aggressive and everybody's seen it. They just have gotten so bold. Folks have never seen anything like it. And it's causing, fortunately for us, strengthening of those relationships that no one else has, uh, the allies and partners. So it's going to be key. Yes, the kind of coercive activity we've seen them undertake in some areas, I think, really focuses the mind. Whether you're India or Vietnam or the Philippines, it definitely focuses the mind. And I think, again, the United States is very much seen as the security partner of choice out there in the region. No question about it. And really, when you look at the modernization and all you talked about earlier and take care of our people, that's just going to strengthen that for us as we go forward. The Army continues to play such a key role. Before we conclude, I've asked a lot of questions and I really appreciate the great responses. Is there anything else you would like to share with our listening audience? Just that I'm so delighted that we are able to have AUSA in person this year and really look forward, hopefully, to 2022, being able to do a completely full-up live AUSA with even more participation. I think this is a very exciting time for the Army. I am very much of the view that we really are, as a nation, at a strategic crossroads. And we have got to really focus on the pacing challenge of China while remembering that we don't have the luxury of being able to do one thing at a time. So we have to keep our eye on the European theater. North Korea has not gone away. Iran has not gone away. So this is a really important moment, and I look forward to working with the whole Army family to make sure that we stay on the transformation path and make sure that our Army is in position to be the important player in the joint force that it has been and needs to be in the future. Well, thank you, ma'am. But we're so fortunate to have you as the secretary during this strategic crossroads time. I think you couldn't have described it better. Such a critical time. And thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your impressive service to our nation. This has been a special edition of AUSA's Army Matters podcast. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great Army day. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters Podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters Podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army Day. Hua.